let's move on now to the section on counting techniques. To start things off, let's suppose that we have a burger shop that we're going to call, uh, just off the top of our head, Bob's Burgers. And uh, they're offering three types of bread. We have white bread, rye bread, and sourdough. A burger can come with or without cheese. How many burgers are possible? Well, let's see. Uh, we have, uh, let's, let's come up with some encoding for our possibilities. Uh, we have white bread, we have rye bread, and we have uh, sourdough, and a burger can come with or without cheese. So we'll say we can have with cheese or we can have no cheese. Uh, all right, so given this encoding, uh, what are the possible burgers that we could have? So we've got our possible burgers, and we could have a burger with white bread and cheese, a burger with rye bread and cheese, and a burger with sourdough and cheese, or a burger with white bread and no cheese, a burger with rye bread and no cheese, and a burger with sourdough and no cheese. And, uh, no cheese. So let's see, how many burgers is that? That's going to be... Uh, six burgers. Uh, so that's the way to do it by hand, where you basically enumerate all the possibilities for uh, how many burgers there are going to be. Uh, but the thing, though, is, uh, I mean, that's only going to work for so long. I mean, it, you, you can you can enumerate stuff when it's possible to do, and then literally count uh, how many possibilities there are. But there's also other ways to possibly represent what's going on here. For example, we could use what's known as a tree diagram. With the tree diagram, we're going to create a tree that uh, visualizes um, the branching possibilities of our choices. So for example, at the first node, we're going to choose the type of bread. So we have white, rye, and sourdough. And then at the second level of node, we decide whether we're going to have cheese or no cheese. So we have um, for the upper branch, uh, cheese, and for the lower branch, no cheese. And we're going to do this uh, a few more times for the different types of bread that we could have chosen. And we've got cheese, no cheese, cheese, no cheese. And then we're going to count how many nodes there are uh, on the endpoints. And the number of nodes on the endpoints will correspond to the number of possible choices. In this case, there are six nodes, so uh, that means six possibilities. And of course, one thing that's nice about these types of tree diagrams is that we could uh, allow for more flexibility in our possibilities, such as uh, perhaps for some reason Bob has decided that he is not going to permit uh, uh, sourdough bread without cheese in which case you just remove that possibility from from the from the tree diagram you remove that branch in which case there would now be five nodes in the branch so it's pretty general uh, uh, there's also something that we can use uh, called the product rule uh, proposition seven if there are n1 possibilities for choice one n2 possibilities for choice two all the way to nk choice of, uh, possibilities for choice k then the total number of possible combinations is going to be the product of the number of possible choices we can make at each point. So uh, let's use the product rule to answer this question. Uh, according to the product rule, uh, we could have uh, three possible choices for the first node and two possible choices for the second node. And thus the total number of possibilities will be three times two which is equal to six. All right, so we've seen so far uh, six ways to basically answer this question. Uh, now, let's uh, move on some more. Uh, the Sandwich Shop Deluxe Deli offers four bread options where we have white, sourdough, whole wheat, and rye, five meat options, turkey, ham, be beef, chicken, or no meat, uh, six cheese options, cheddar, white cheddar, Swiss American pepper jack, and no cheese, with or without lettuce, with or without tomatoes, with or without bacon, with or without mayonnaise, and with or without mustard. How many sandwiches are possible? Let's see. Uh, how many decisions do we have to make? 
first we need to decide on our bread option. So we'll say that that's uh, decision one. So we'll say that in one, there are uh, four possible options. So four, uh, then we can decide uh, our meat options and there's uh, five meat options. Uh, we have six cheese options. So N3 will be six. Uh, there are, and then for the remaining options, it's all binary. So we've got with or without lettuce. So that means that N4 equals two. With or without tomatoes. So N5 equals two. With or without bacon. So N6 equals two. With or without mayonnaise. So N7 equals two. And with or without mustard, so N8 equals 2. Okay, so based off this, how many sandwiches are possible? Well, according to the product rule, we're just going to multiply all of those numbers together. So we've got 4 times 5 times 6 times uh, 2, 5 times. So we'll say 2 to the 5th power. So this, when you multiply all this out, you're going to end up with 3,800 40 possibilities for this sandwich shop. Okay, so uh, moving on. Here's here's the thing. We are now uh, very fully into the realm of combinatorics. Combinatorics is generally figuring out how many ways there are to do things, and. Uh, Combi or how many combinations there are of things, how large uh, finite size sets are when they're generated with certain rules. And honestly, combinatorics is pretty hard. Like, for example, I find combinatorics rather challenging. Um, I remember once when I was in um, a probability class and uh, I was in... Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I was uh, in office hours with a professor and a fellow student of mine. Just We, we were t discussing combinatorics and uh, my, a fellow student of mine was just like, is this what probability is or, or statistics is? Because if it is, I, I don't know if I want to do this. And he was like, no, it's not. Uh, you just kind of have to do this. You, you have to learn this at some point, uh, but it's not what the bulk of probability is. And I can understand why she said that because... It can get pretty painful. Here's the thing about combinatorics. Uh, what I'm about to do is give you some tools, some counting tools for prob for uh, counting type problems that are often reappearing. But the thing is, every single combinatorics problem is its own thing. It's really hard to come up with general tools. Like what I'm coming up with here. Um, they are certainly tools in a toolbox, uh, things that you kind of look out for when you're solving combinatorics type problems, but you still need to think of its own, of each problem as its own thing. And for this section, I kind of have to come up with a number of examples and run through those examples to give you an idea of the thought process of combinatorics, but it's really hard to teach that thought process, uh, without examples since I can't just give you an algorithm that will solve every single combinatorics problem. Every problem is its own beast and you're pretty much forced to think very carefully about uh, the process by which a single combination has been formed. Uh, also, I should probably just mention uh, if we have, uh, there's, there's something that I didn't mention in these uh, typed up notes but I call this the sum rule. Uh, so uh, if you're choosing uh, from k uh, k disjoint sets, uh, so sets each with uh, uh, each uh, with um, we'll say um, n sub i uh, possibilities uh, uh, possible choices uh, at one stage so you're gonna pick 
uh, one of these sets and an item from that set, uh, then in this case, uh, there's going to be the sum from i equals one uh, to k uh, n sub i uh, possible oh, so possibilities. So in other words, if you need to choose an item from bin A or an item from bin B exclusively, then the number of ways you can make that decision is going to be the sum of the items in those two bins. Not a particularly difficult concept, but I'm going to just lay it out for you right now just so that you are aware of that. And it's a, it's a valid approach to solving combinatorics problems. And I would say that the, the uh, techniques that I'm about to show, like these will... These will get you through, th these are things that you look out for when solving combinatorics problems, uh, but uh, they probably won't take you all the way. All right, so uh, when we're solving some problems, uh, suppose that out of n possibilities, we will be choosing k. We have two essential questions to answer. Um, are we choosing with or without replacement, and does order matter? Depending on our answer to those questions, we're going to have different solutions that are summarized below. Uh, here, uh, if if the choice was where uh, there's order and we're doing so with replacement, then the number of possible outcomes is n to the power of k. Uh, ordered without replacement, that's known as a permutation. And here is a formula for a permutation. Uh, n factorial, by the way. So this... so. Uh, n with an exclamation point means n factorial. And that is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 uh, times dot 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 uh, times 3 times 2 times 1. That is n factorial. And by convention, 0 factorial equals 1. Huh, that's kind of strange. Uh, at least for me, when I first saw that 0 factorial equals 1, I found it rather surprising. But actually, it makes perfect sense for 0 factorial to equal 1. And I might may explain why 0 factorial is 1 in a separate video. Uh, but we're just going to leave it at that. So that is what n factorial is. Um, um, one way to think of what n factorial is, it's, it's the number of, way to order, number of ways to order n things. So it's the number of permutations of n things. Um, uh, now, in this case, for uh, ordered with without replacement, uh, we we all we're also calling that a permutation. Uh, it's just a permutation of k things out of n. So uh, suppose that uh, we are that we don't have replacement. So remember what re so think about what replacement means. It means that uh, so replace it means that if you choose uh, an option, you can choose it again. So you're allowed to choose it again. Uh, an example of, of ordered with replacement is a sequence of heads and tails in coin flips, where you may consider possibly, you may not, but if you're looking at a string, there are different ways that heads and tails can manifest themselves in the string. And furthermore, uh, if you get heads on the first flip, you're still allowed to get heads on the second flip. Whereas if you don't have replacement, you can get heads on the first flip, but you can't get heads on the second flip. So that would be without replacement. And order matters. That means uh, you're, that means that the order in which you see an item in a sequence matters. So you're tracking that. So heads, heads, tails is different from heads, tails, heads. Whereas if order doesn't matter, then heads, heads, tails is essentially the same as heads, tails, heads. Because you don't care about the ordering of the items. So that's what we mean by with or without replacement or with or without order. Okay, so suppose that we're choosing items where order doesn't matter and uh, we don't have replacement. In that situation, uh, we have, we're going to use the formula n choose k, which is n factorial divided by k factorial uh, and n. Uh, or the product of k factorial and minus k factorial. I'm going to prove each one of these formulas in a second because I do believe that the proofs 
are enlightening on the combinatoric thought process. And the combinatoric thought process is something where you just kind of have to get exposed to it a lot in order to be able to uh, think that way yourself. Um, finally, we have the situation where uh, re you are you're choosing with replacement, but order doesn't matter. Uh, in which case, you're going to have k plus n minus 1 choose n minus 1. Okay, so next up is uh, the, uh, the proofs or the justifications for each of these formulas. We're going, and I'm going to uh, prove this in um, a sneaking fashion or a clockwise manner because often the formula uh, often the formula in this uh, clockwise order from before is going to be used in the next proof okay so uh, let's get started uh, we're going to start by showing by proving the formula in we in which case we have ordering and so and we also have replacement All right, so ordered with replacement. I'm going to zoom in because I'm going to need some, uh, I'm going to need more space. All right, so we want to come up with the formula um, n to the power k. Well, all right, so we have k choices to make, and since we have replacement, we're going to use the product rule. The product rule is kind of the underlying uh, rule that we can use for all of these. So starting out with the product rule, We have k decisions to make. I like to think of combina of uh, combinatoric problems where you are describing in a combinatoric problem how to construct an instance of an element of this set. And um, when you are thinking about how to construct an element, you construct a narrative for how to uh, construct one of these elements. And you're counting how many ways there are to make the decisions along the way. And you're tracking how and you're tracking how many decisions you need to make, and uh, using the product rule the entire time. So uh, we can think of if we're uh, doing ordering with replacement, we might have, for example, um, we might have, for example, three spaces, and we need to fill up those spaces with elements. So uh, we might have two possibilities for each space. So at the first space, uh, we would have two possibilities, and at the second space, we'd have two possibilities. And at the third space, we have two possibilities, and we care about the ordering, and um, uh, we care about the ordering of uh, what we put in in these spaces. So the number of possibilities for filling up these three spaces would be two to the power three, because we're going to multiply, and we have to make a decision at each space. And when you have to make a decision at each space, you multiply the possible number of decisions that you needed to make. So. Uh, generalizing this idea, uh, we have uh, we need to make a decision in the first slot, the second thought, the the third slot, all the way to the kth slot. And for each of these, and and for each of these slots, there were n possible things to choose one from because we're not taking uh, we're not removing options as we go through our sequence of k slots. So then by using the product rule, according to the product rule, we end up having to multiply, um, we, ha we end up having to multiply uh, each of our possibilities uh, or, or each of the possible options we can make at each slot. But since all of those are the same, uh, since all of those are the same number, uh, you end up with uh, multiplying n k times, which is n to the power k. So that gives us the first formula. The next formula we need to come up with is uh, ordering without replacement, which gives us uh, the number of permutations. Okay, so we now next have, oops, that is definitely not what I wanted. All right, so next up we have ordered without replacement. I'm going to go back for a second and 
I have in my head prototype problems for each of these four scenarios. So ordering with replacement is like determining how many strings of heads and tails there are in a string of flips. Because the ordering in that situation wouldn't matter because you're track because heads tails is not the same as tails heads in a string. And you have replacement because if you get heads on the first flip, you can get heads again on the second flip. Um, ordering without replacement, to me, my prototype uh, problem for that is forming a list. Because the item that you put at the top of the list cannot be chosen for the, sec for the next item in the list. So you are removing items as you go through this list. And maybe it's like a times top, top 100 people or 100 people for the year list where... The ordering matters, and there's certainly more people than a hundred, so they might have this uh, larger, this larger master list of uh, people they would consider to be candidates on their top 100 list. So you're going to choose people to be in certain slots on this list, and when you choose a person to be on the list, you can't pick them again. Um, so that's kind of my prototype problem for uh, ordered with re without replacement for. Um, uh, not ordered and with replacement, this is like uh, poker problems because when you draw cards from a, a deck of cards, you are allowed to reorder the cards in your hand so there is no ordering. But once you draw a card, you cannot draw it again. So there isn't replacement. And for the final situation, my prototype problem here is choosing a dozen donuts when you have uh, so many flavors of donuts. Because you are allowed to reorder the donuts in the box. And in principle, the donut shop has this almost infinite list for the number of... Uh, or an almost infinite supply of donuts in this imaginary donut shop. So there is replacement when you choose a flavor like, when you choose a flavor, you're allowed to choose as many donuts of that flavor as, as you want. So, a replacement is not an issue. All right? So, you do have, in fact, replacement. Those are my prototype problems. And those are good to keep in mind when we're going through and trying to think about what formulas we're, we should have and how we're going to uh, prove these formulas. And additionally, uh, it's kind of good to have these prototype problems in your mind when you're trying to solve common torque problems yourself. All right, so next up, uh, getting back to these proofs, uh, we need to show the formula for ordering without replacement. Uh, so I had that formula for n factorial. Um, so, all right, so how many ways are there to uh, form a list of k things uh, when you have n possibilities? So we would need to pick the first item in the list, and the number of ways that we could pick the first item in the list is n. Then we need to pick the, the so there are n ways to pick the first item in the list. Then we need to pick the second item in the list. So there are going to be n minus one ways to pick the second. The reason why is that whatever we chose to be our, our first element in the list cannot be chosen again to be the second element. So we have n minus one ways to fill the second item. Then we have n minus two ways to pick the, thir the third item because now, not, in addition to not being able to pick what we chose for the first item in the list, we also can't pick what we chose for the second item of the list. So we're going to have n minus two way, uh, n minus two choices now. So n minus two ways uh, for the second item. No, 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 not the second, the third. And we just continue on with this uh, uh, with this process until we reach the kth slot. Uh, and there will be, uh, for the kth item in the list, there will be n minus k minus 1 ways to pick that item, which, by the way, is equal to n minus k uh, plus 1. 
right? So so n, n minus k plus one ways to pick the kth item. So then we're going to use the product rule And by the product rule, we multiply all of these numbers together. So we're going to get, uh, so the number of possibilities is going to be n times n minus 1 times dot 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 times uh, n minus k minus 1. And if we wanted to, we could stop there. This is, in fact, the formula. But the thing, though, is it's sometimes uh, better to, uh, we, we might prefer a more compact uh, formula. So we might say instead that um, we have n, n minus 1, n minus 2, uh, dot, dot, dot. And then we have n minus k plus 1. And then we could keep going multiplying and say we're going to multiply by n minus k. And still, you know, still decreasing down. But but we've now multiplied by n minus k. And if we're going to multiply by n minus k, we now need to divide by n minus k in order to keep things balanced. And then we're going to multiply by n minus k minus 1. Okay, so we're going to need to divide by n minus k minus 1. And we're going to keep going with this process on both the top and the bottom until we're mul we multiply 3, 2, and 1. And what I've actually written down in doing this, the top can be recognized. Uh, so the top uh, part of this uh, fraction, you may, you may recognize that as being, uh, I, I don't want that color. You may recognize the top part as being n factorial. And the bottom part of the fraction, the denominator, as being uh, as being n minus k factorial. Hence, uh, producing the formula, this will produce the formula uh, n factorial over n minus k factorial, which we may also just call p n k. And that gives us our second formula. Okay. Uh, next one. We now what we now need to do is figure out how many ways there are to choose items that are not ordered and there is no replacement. Uh, this gives us the formula that is often referred to in English as n choose k. Uh, so the proof for this one is actually quite tricky where you start out by assuming that you know how to do it and then you get recover the formula in the end where you you pretend that you know the formula and after you pretend that you know the formula you then figure out something that you already know which in this case is the number of permutations of a list and uh once you have the number of permutations in the list you're able to recover uh the formula that you pretended that you knew but you actually did, actually didn't all right, so that's that's rather convoluted. Let's get started with uh, uh, showing how we can get this formula. So the proof, again, is kind of weird. It's a really weird one, but all of a sudden, at the end, uh, we're going to have the result that we wanted. So we have no order, and we don't have replacement. Keep touching that. All right, I keep touching it. All right, so not ordered without replacement. So suppose uh, n choose k is the number of ways to is the number of ways to do this. So we know how, 
so we know uh, the number of ways to choose items when we don't care about order and we don't care about replacement, and the number of ways to do so is n choose k. Okay, bear with me. I now want to know how many ways are there going to be to pick uh, to pick uh, k items out of n when replacement doesn't matter. So as opposed to um, doing so in order doesn't matter, which we're assuming that we know. Uh, that mm -hmm. is what I want to do. I want it, it, what I want to do is calculate uh, uh, P and K or the number of, of K length permutations of N objects. Okay. So, uh, I want to compute that, which, by the way, we have already computed. That's That formula is actually already known to us. It's up here. But we're going to suggest that there is an alternative way to calculate this if somehow you knew the number of ways to pick uh, k items out of n uh, without, uh, without order. So, how would we do this? How would we... Let's think about how we would construct a single permutation if what we had to do was pick items without order first. So our first step, if we were to attempt to form a single list of K items out of N, uh, when we can pick items without ordering them, the first thing we would do is pick the number of items uh, or pick what items will appear on the list without ordering them first. So our first step in our process is to pick objects when order doesn't matter. So you've decided basically what's going to appear on the list. You just don't know in what slots it will appear. And supposedly, we know how to do so. Uh, there's n choose k ways to do so. So there are n choose k ways to pick the items that will appear on our list without ordering the items. So first, we pick a set of items that will appear on the list. The next step then is to order those items. So the second step is to order the K objects. So how do we order the K objects? Well, uh, we pick the first, uh, so we pick uh, one of the objects that we have selected to be the first item on the list. Uh, there's K ways to do that. Uh, then we pick w another one of the objects that we haven't picked yet to be the second item on the list. There's K minus ways to k minus one ways to do that keep doing so until you run out of items so there are uh, k factorial ways to order the items Oops. oh darn it so there's k minus one ways to order the items uh, going back to where I was or k factorial uh, ways to order. So now we're going to use the product rule and say that the number of ways to pick uh, items to appear on our list is going to be the number of uh, is going to be the number of decisions we have to make in step one, which is the number of ways to pick the items to appear on the list. Uh, there's n choose k ways to do that. Uh, and then multiply that with the number of ways to order the items. So there will be k factorial.
So that's the number of ways to form permutations, but we also know that the number of ways to get permutations from what we did before is n factorial divided by n minus k factorial. Okay, well what we actually were interested in this whole time was calculating this number that I just highlighted in red. That's the number we actually want. Well, how can we get that? With division. Because now we have an algebraic relationship uh, with which we can so that we can solve to get n choose k. And it follows that n choose k is equal to n factorial divided by k factorial times n minus k factorial. And we're done. We computed what we actually wanted to compute. So that was a little odd. That was a little strange. Um, here's some more ways to kind of justify uh, this formula that we ended up with. Uh, so the number of permutations is larger than the number of combinations because the, because when you are sensitive to order, uh, you're going to end up with uh, many more possibilities than if you're not sensitive to order. So as a result, you need to uh, divide out uh, by a factor that effectively removes uh, all of the orderings that are that contain the same items that just in different and just in a different arrangement in order to get the combinations. Uh, and when it comes to computation, like uh, let's say for example, three choose no, uh, five choose three. Um, this formula, for me at least, when I was taking this class, the way I think of it is I have five factorial on the bottom, and on the bottom I'm going no, I have five factorial on the top, and on the bottom I'm going to have three factorial and whatever it takes to get to and the other number such that three and the other number adds up to five. So I'm going to have five factorial divided by three factorial times two factorial. Okay, so that's a way. So the formula is actually not that hard to remember because it's like, okay, uh, 10 choose 7. That's going to be 10 factorial divided by, well, we've got 7 factorial down there, and we've also got something that adds up to 10. Okay, 3 factorial. So 10 factorial divided by 7 factorial times 3 factorial. So the formula itself is not that hard to remember, uh, but you now have it. Okay, uh, continuing on. Uh, so that was our third formula that I promised that we were going to prove. Uh, so now we have one last formula to prove. Uh, and that formula is, let's see how much space we got. Uh, hopefully we've got enough. So the last formula we have uh, not ordered. And we have replacement. So this is the donut shop situation. Okay. So the donut shop uh, situation. Uh, here's like this. This proof is again also rather tricky. Combinatorics often requires tricks, honestly. That that's that's one th that's one reason why combinatorics is rather painful. Uh, it feels like there are rather few unifying uh, principles in combinatorics. I know that there are some, but it doesn't really seem that there, there there's all that many. So here's what we're going to do to um, to solve this one. Uh, what let's let's suppose that we're in a donut shop and we're going to choose. Uh, say five donuts of three flavors. Uh, how could we possibly do that? Uh, we don't care about the ordering of the donuts because you put it in the box and I mean, no one's going to ask in what order the donuts were when you come home. So what I like to do is imagine, okay, whatever we're going to do, we're always going to arrange the donuts in the box, right? So So whatever arrangement they originally were, we're going to put them into a fixed arrangement where we have one flavor first, one flavor second, and one flavor flavor third. So what we could end up doing to form a single box after we'd say that we're going to rearrange them, rearrange them at the very end is we're going to have uh, we're going to 
uh, put down all the donuts of a single flavor, and we know that the donut that comes first um, is going to be of a certain flavor, um, but we're also going to put dividers in our box to separate flavors. So, so the second flavor will come after the first divider, and the third flavor will come after the second divider. So, and it is also possible to uh, not have a donut of uh, certain flavors. So, for example, if we wanted a box of only the third flavor, we put a divider in the first position, a divider in the second position, and then put donuts in all the remaining positions. And with this encoding, I have now encoded one of the bo one of the boxes of five donuts. Uh, this is a box where you have only the third flavor, and you can imagine what a box uh, consisting of only the second flavor would look like. So you'd have a divider at the beginning and a divider at the end, and then in between, you have your donuts. So this is a box that has only donuts of the second flavor. And maybe play around with this encoding of donut boxes. But once we have this encoding, it is now possible to calculate how many, how many boxes we can achieve. Because what we can do is say, how many ways are there to pick positions for dividers and positions for donuts? How many ways are there to do that? Well, we're going to have, if, in the, if we have uh, three flavors, we're going to have two dividers. And if we have five donuts, we're going to have positions for five donuts. So we're going to end up with seven positions that we need to fill up. Uh, I mean, we could just pick two of the seven positions to contain dividers, and the remaining positions will contain donuts. So let's see. We could potentially pick numbers. Uh, we could assign a number to each of the positions. So we have positions one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and we pick numbers that represent positions that will contain dividers. So in this case, uh, uh, numbers four and six represent positions four and six. So those will be, uh, so if we pick four and six, which by the way is the same as picking six and four to contain dividers. So in other words, we don't care on the ordering of the numbers that we end up picking. Uh, once we pick that, we now know what our box of donuts is going to be because we've picked the positions for the dividers and therefore every other position will contain donuts. Okay. All right then. Um, so if that is the case, how many boxes of donuts are there going to be? Um, so in this case, the number of possibilities, which is N in this scenario is equal to three. And out of that N, we're going to be choosing uh, K possibilities. Or, or, or we're going to be choosing K items or K donuts. So for this problem, K is equal to five. Okay. So um, how many ways were there to make this decision? Well, it turns out uh, there were um, there were uh, five plus three minus one, choose three minus one ways to pick donuts in this fashion. Because we end up picking the, uh, or in other words, this is uh, uh, this is seven choose two. Because we had seven slots and we picked two of those slots to contain dividers and the rest of the slots contain donuts, hence we get the number of donuts. All right, so let's generalize this idea. So if we have n possibilities, we're going to have n minus one div uh, n minus one plus k slots because we're going to have n minus one dividers and then also the k slots for the k things that we're going to end up picking. So in general, um, uh, so let's see. Uh, so we're, so we have, um, so we have, uh, n, uh, no, uh, k plus n minus slots n minus one slots uh, to fill with uh, n minus one dividers 
which we call uh, th which we are going to call the the bar uh, remaining slots uh, so the remaining slots contain items uh, so we need to pick uh, so pick the positions let's see yeah so pick positions for the dividers and order doesn't matter So, since order doesn't matter, there are going to be uh, n plus, uh, no, uh, I like a different ordering. Uh, there are going to be k plus n minus 1, choose n minus 1 ways to do so. And we're done. You end up with the formula. And we're done. So that was exhausting. Uh, this is rather tricky types of mathematics that honestly, it's it's frustrating because it often just requires knowing special tricks in order to solve a certain problem. It just feels like all you're doing is coming up with a longer and longer list of tricks and it doesn't really feel like there's much of a unifying principle to them. Uh, at least to me, at least to me personally. It's, it seems also to me like there are some people out there, some really smart mathematicians for which this type of thinking just for some reason just clicks and they and they are able to see an underlying principle. I don't see it necess uh, often, uh, but I often know enough combinatorics like this. Com this amount of combinatorics will get you very far in life uh, in your statistics life. That is uh, you don't really need to know that much more than this. All right, uh, so those were complicated proofs. Uh, now we're gonna go through a series of examples to show uh, how these techniques can be applied. So uh, suppose we're going to roll two six-sided dice and we assume each outcome is equally likely. Um, and we're going to say that the dice are different colors. So uh, if the red dice has a six and the blue dice has a one, that's different from the red dice having a one and a blue dice having a six. Those are two different po those are two different outcomes. How many possible outcomes are there? And what about the situation when there's three six-sided die? Uh, so we're going to first answer problem that I'm going to call one and the problem that I'm going to call two. All right. Uh, so the answer to one uh, order matters, and we're doing so with replacement because if we roll um, a one for the red dice, we're still allowed to roll a one for the blue dice. So we end up with, uh, there are six possibilities and we're choosing two of them, so we get 36. All right, uh, for the next option, uh, well, it's just the same thing. Now there's we're just choosing three instead of two. So this is going to be 216. So this is a situation where order matters because the, di dice, is, the dice are different colors and uh, there is replacement because dice don't care what the other dice rolled. All right, uh, next example. A high school has 27 boys playing men's basketball. In basketball, there are five positions, point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward, and center. Each assignment of player to position is unique. How many teams can then be formed? This is a, this is a permutation type problem so here, order matters because there's different positions. And each of those positions are distinct. But there is a replacement because a person playing point guard cannot also be center. So position doesn't matter. Oh, no, position matters. Or order matters. No, sorry, sorry. No replacement. No replacement. I get it eventually. <laughs> All right, so uh, no replacement. No 
So that means we're going to be using that uh, second uh, that second formula in the clock. Uh, so we've got uh, P, uh, there's uh, 27 possibilities. We're going to order five of them. So that's going to be 27 factorial divided by uh, 27 minus 5 factorial, uh, which is 27 factorial uh, over 22 factorial, which also can be written as uh, maybe more simply and to the point, 27 times 26 times 25 uh, times 24 times 23. That's almost easier than remembering the formula, just remembering that you uh, decrement that many times. Uh, and this multiplies out to uh, 9,687,600 potential teams. Okay, uh, example 19. When playing poker, players draw five cards from a 52 card deck. Every card is distinct, but the order of the draw does not matter. You are allowed to reorder the cards in your hand. How many hands are possible? In this situation, because you're allowed to reorder, order doesn't matter. And since order, and also in addition to ordering not mattering, there is no replacement because if you draw an ace, you can't, uh, if you draw an ace of spades, you're not allowed to draw an ace of spades again. So no replacement. Okay, uh, so let's see. If that's the case, then we're going to use that four, third formula in the clock. Uh, we have uh, 52 possibilities for 52 cards. We're going to choose five of them when we draw cards. And that's going to be 52 factorial divided by 5 factorial times 47 factorial. Which is equal to uh, 52 times 51 times 50 times 49 times 48 divided by 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 okay uh, and we and we don't care about the 1 because it's times 1 that that doesn't really do anything um, we can do some cancellation like for example the 50 and the 5 cancel down to a 10 uh, the 4, 3, and 2, those met, multiply the 24, so that reduces with the 48, rendering it a 2. So this is equal to 52 times uh, 51 times uh, 10 times 49 times 2, which you then go to your calculator, and it will give you 2 million uh, 598,000 uh, 960 poker hands. Now, R can do a lot of these calculations. So for uh, example 16, you can just say, what is 6 to the power of 2? And it'll tell you that the 36. And for 6 to the power of 3, that's 216. Uh, R does have a factorial function. Now, be careful with some of these functions because you might end up with integer overflow. You might end up with numbers that are so large that uh, the computer cannot handle them. So I would not just blindly use these functions because it is possible for these numbers to explode very rapidly, in which case uh, your calculations will end up being wrong. But we do have a factorial function and we do have a choose function. So here's example 17 and here's example 18. Um, uh, so, or is that, that numbering might be wrong. Yeah, that, that, that numbering is wrong. My apologies. Uh, so I guess at some point when I wrote this, uh, R code, uh, I, uh, or when I wrote these notes, I must've deleted an example a long time ago, but I did not change the comments in the R code. This is why I need to be very careful with comments. Comments expire eventually they turn bad all right and you know what's worse than a no uh, than no comment a misleading comment that's even worse um all right so example 20 
Uh, you want to choose a dozen donuts from a donut shop. There are eight different kinds of donuts. How many boxes of a dozen donuts are possible? Well, okay, so in this situation, uh, we are choosing 12 donuts and there are eight possibilities. So using that uh, fourth formula in the clock, we have uh, 12 plus eight minus one, choose uh, eight minus one possibilities, which is going to be 19 choose seven, which is equal to 19 factorial uh, divided by uh, seven factorial times 12 factorial, which is equal to uh, 19 times 18 times 17 times 16 times 15 times 14 times 13 divided by seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. All right, and uh, let's do some cancellation to help make our life a little bit easier. Uh, let's see, the seven and the two are going to cancel with the 14. Uh, we've got, uh, what else? Uh, four and 16, we'll reduce the 16 down to four. Uh, the five and the three will cancel out the 15 and the six cancels out with the 18 reducing it to three. So in the end, we're going to have, this is 19 times 17 times 13 times three times four. And then you go to your calculator and ask what that is. And then you'll get 50,388 potential boxes of donuts from this donut shop. Okay. And here is some R code that will also uh, compute that quantity. Okay, uh, so let's do some classic poker problems. Once people uh, introduce combinatorics, it's like the next thing you have to talk about are poker problems because poker problems are fun. Because poker is fun. It's fun to talk about poker. Um, so, um, now that said, there is... Uh, one potential with talking about poker problems is that unfortunately not everyone is familiar with the poker deck or the standard playing card deck as it's known in the English speaking world, which for what it's worth, the standard deck is technically the French deck and different European countries have different traditional playing card decks. So like for example, my advisor, Leos Horvath, the traditional deck that's used in Hungary is not the French deck. So he doesn't like personally poker problems because there's something that like it, they talk about a deck and he's not very familiar with that deck and it just goes against his intuition. Whereas I myself, I grew up with this deck. I grew up in America. So I'm very familiar with, uh, with what is inside of a playing card deck. That said, if you're like an international student or something like that, here is a description of what is inside of a playing card of a standard playing card deck or an, uh, a, a French deck, the deck that's used in the English speaking world and often used in these probability textbooks because most of these probability authors are uh, most most of these most of the authors of these uh, probability books they may be in America, but they're certainly speaking English so they're probably using uh, this deck. So and here's some additional notation for, uh, this is a poker notation to describe what goes inside, uh, what cards are inside of a deck. All right. So, but basically you've got four suites and 13 possible faces. Uh, all right. So if we're a total of 52 possible cards, you should know how to do that by now, because, uh, how do you form a single card? You first pick uh, a suit. There's four suits possible. Then pick a face value. There's 13 faces. So 13 times four will be 52. All right, so you've learned something today. Uh, example 21, a poker hand is four of a kind. If four cards have the same face value, how many four of a kind hands exist? How are we going to solve this problem? Well, uh, the trick that we're going to use, again, with these poker, with these, not just poker problems, but most combinatorial problems, what I suggest that you do is come up with a narrative like I just did right now for figuring out how many cards there are in a deck. Come up with a narrative 
for forming a single combination. And then once you have that narrative, figure out how many choices there were to make at each at each junction and multiply them together with the pop uh, with the uh, power rule and you'll get what you need. Um, so first thing we're going to do to form a four of a kind hand is we're going to decide what card face value will be the four of a kind card. So first we're going to pick uh, the four of a kind card. So we're going to say, for example, there are going to be four kings in this hand or uh, four twos or four tens, something like that. So we need to pick a face value and there are 13 face values to be the four of a kind part. All right. So there are 13 ways to pick the face value. Then we need to pick the remaining card because a poker hand has five cards. We have picked four of those cards. If we decided that we were going to use the ace, uh, we were going to use ace for the four of a kind card, then we've automatically got the ace of spades, the ace of hearts, the ace of diamonds, and the ace of clubs. That's four cards. Now we need to pick the remaining card. If we picked ace, then we cannot pick the ace face value again. So uh, we've and in fact, in that fifty-two card deck, we have taken out four of the cards and put them in our hand leaving 48 cards remaining in our deck so that means that we have 48 cards to be the potential fifth card so pick the fifth card so 13 times 48 you multiply those two numbers together to get 624 poker hands with four of a kind Okay, uh, next up, a poker hand is considered full house if two cards have the same face value and three different cards have another common face value. How many full house hands exist? Let me just list out for you an example of a full house hand. You could have, let's say, the four of diamonds, the four of spades, so the four of spades and uh, the four of uh, hearts. And uh, so that's three cards with a common face value. And then we need two cards with another face value. We can't pick four for this. So we're going to pick, uh, let's say, king. So we'll have the king of uh, clubs and the king of uh, diamonds. So this would be a full house hand. So let's see, how can we form a full house hand in general? Well, we're going to have two different face values in our full house hand, uh, but one face value will be the more numerous face value, the three of a kind, and the other face value will be the two of a kind. So what I suggest we do is first pick the card that will be the three of a kind card. So pick the card that will be the three of a kind card. Uh, so pick the three of a kind. Face value. Uh, and uh, there's 13 face values for this choice. So there's 13 ways to make that choice. Then we need to pick the suits because we picked, for example, four. But there are four suits from which we can choose, and we need to pick three of them. So now we need to pick the suits. And order doesn't matter in this situation. We don't care about the ordering of the suits, we just need to pick them. So, so we need to pick exactly three suits for all those three cards. And since order doesn't matter for this choice, uh, we have four choose three ways to pick the suits and four choose three evaluates to four which is not surprising in a, like alternatively and by the way this this thought process is quite useful instead of picking the three faces we're going to include we could have picked the one face no 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 not face i'm so sorry uh i 
for the life of me, I can't keep my words straight. I'm always doing this. Uh, so not face, but suits. Uh, instead of picking uh, the three suits we're going to include, we could pick the one suit we're going to exclude. And there's four ways to pick the suit we're going to skip. All right, so there's a useful trick to keep in mind. Uh, next up, we need to pick the two of a kind card. We need to pick the two of a kind face value. So we can't pick what we chose before. Uh, we Like for example, we couldn't choose four again. So we need to pick one of the 12 remaining face values. So there's 12 ways to make this choice. And then after we pick the face of the two of a kind card, we now need to pick the suits. Uh, so we need to pick two suits. And again, uh, we need to do so where we don't have replacement, but order doesn't matter. You can't have replacement because there are not two uh, King of Hearts in the deck. There is only one King of Heart, so you pick. Uh, so yeah, you can't uh, pick the same suit twice. Uh, so um, of the four suits, we need to choose two of them to include. Uh, so that's going to be four choose two. Four choose two evaluates to six. So in the end... This is going to equal uh, 13 times 12 times 6 times 4, which is equal to uh, 3,744 uh, full house hands. All right. Uh, and here's some R code that's computing those quantities. Uh, notice, by the way, this is a useful trick to to know, to be aware of uh, when doing uh, when when using R. Notice that I wrapped the entire expression in parentheses. If I didn't put the parentheses there, nothing would have printed. But when I wrap an entire expression in parentheses, uh, when I'm doing some variable assignment, the variable uh, the value of the variable that I just assigned gets printed, which is really nice. So uh, if you have removed these parentheses, these parentheses, the 624 would not have been printed. But since I put the parentheses there, it, uh, in addition to doing the assignment done here, it prints the value of the variable. That's a, that's a nice trick. Uh, all right, so uh, example 23. A flush is a poker hand where all cards belong to the same suit. How many flush hands exist, including what's called a straight flush? A straight flush is a flush where the cards are also, where you can order the cards so that they're in sequence. Uh, poker actually has a number of sequences, but for example, a hand where all the cards are spades and the cards are five, six, seven, eight, nine, that is a straight flush since they're also in, or since you can order them. Right, and a straight flush is considered a different kind of hand in poker. That's uh, a straight flush is in fact the best possible poker hand. So uh, we actually should be accounting for straight flushes because generally when people say flush, they are not including straight flush. But we're just going to include straight flushes for now. Um, we're going to allow that possibility. So. Uh, for a flush hand, we're going to... So in a flush hand, all the cards have the same suit. There are four possible suits. So the first thing we need to do is pick the suit. And there are four ways to pick the suit. After we pick the suit, we need to pick the face values. So there are 13 possible face values. We need to pick five of them to be in our hand. So uh, once you pick one face value, you cannot pick it again because there are no two king of spades, for example. So there are 13 face values and we're going to choose five of them. We don't care about the ordering and we're going to do so without replacement. So you multiply those two numbers together. Uh, this is going to be four times... Uh, 1,287, that's what that uh, 13 choose 5 evaluates to. And this is going to equal 
5,148. But this is also including the straight flush hands. Uh, in the next problem, I'm going to show you how we could potentially uh, remove the straight flush hands because I'm actually going to ask that we that we do in fact remove them. So a straight in poker is where cards can be arranged in sequence. So for example, we have five of uh, five of spades, six of clubs, seven of clubs, eight of hearts, nine of hearts. So this is a straight. And the suit doesn't matter for a straight unless it's a straight flush. If it's a straight flush, the suit must be the same because it's also a flush. So a straight flush is both a straight and a flush. So it is a flush with all cards. Uh, no, it is. Uh, uh, so it is. Um, uh, I should change the, that wording. Uh, it is a straight. It is a straight with all cards belonging to the same suit. And it is also the best possible poker hand. Uh, hold on. Okay, good. All right. Uh, how many straight flush hands exist? We're going to compute that number now. Uh, how many straight flushes exist? So to get a straight flush, so let's uh, let's uh, start some separations. Uh, so first thing we're going to do is compute the straight flush. All right. So, excuse me. Uh, here, by the way, um, is uh, the uh, the ordering of poker hands because poker poker face values have a rank uh, have a ranking. Uh, we have ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven eight, nine, and I'm going to write X for 10, the Roman numeral X. Then we have uh, uh, Jack, Queen, uh, King, and also Ace again, because Ace can be both low and high. Um, and in fact, the best literal possible poker hand is 10 Jack, Queen, King, Ace, all of the same suit. That is the best straight flush. Okay. Um, so uh, to have so to so for the flush part, we, we need to figure out how many ways there are for the flush part and how many, how many ways there are to get the straight part. So there are four ways to pick the flush part, the part where you have the same suit. So we're going to pick the suit for the flush part. And then we have the straight part and the straight part for that. What I would recommend you do is think about how many ways there are to pick the first card. So pick the first card of the straight. Because if you know that the first card or the lowest card of the straight is ace, since you, there are five cards in hand, that means that the other four cards are two, three, four, five, right? So how many ways are there to pick the lowest card in the straight? So let's see, we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, well, 10. Well, what do you know? Because the moment you get to 10, the, the, uh, the straight hand would be 10, Jack, Queen, King, Ace, and there is no straight that starts with the Jack because there is no you would not be able to get the fifth card since you can't circle around back to two so um so that means that there's 10 ways to pick the lowest card in the straight so that means that the number of straight flush hands is going to be four times 10 which equals 40. all right and i asked also how many straights are possible but this time i'm not including straight flush because straight flush is considered different Well, uh, the first thing we're going to do is pick the lowest card. Like we did above. And then we're going to pick the suits. So pick the suits of the cards. So we decided that there are 10 ways to pick the first card um, of... Uh, to pick the first card of the straight 
And now to pick the suits. Well, if I decide that the first card, uh, let's say the ace, is going to be clubs, and then I pick the next card, which is going to be a two, I can still pick clubs again. Because I took out the, the ace of clubs, but I didn't take out the two of clubs, so I can still pick clubs for that second card. So, and I can still pick clubs for the third card, and so on. So basically, I do have replacement, but order does matter, because... Uh, picking the first card to be the Ace of Clubs and the second card to be the Two of Hearts is different from the first card being the Ace of Hearts and the second card being the Two of Clubs. Those are two different hands. So order does matter. And also, um, uh, you're doing so with replacement. There are four possibilities. We need to pick five of them. So this will be four to the power of five. The thing, though, is once I've done this, I am including... Picking the first card to be hearts, the second card to be hearts, the third card to be hearts, the fourth card to be hearts, and the fifth card to be hearts, that's a straight flush. I don't want to include straight flushes. So how am I going to remove the straight flushes? I'm going to subtract them out. So this is uh, straight flushes. So just remove them. Remove them from the calculation. Subtract them out. And you no longer need to worry about them anymore. This is basically, remember that sum rule that I very briefly mentioned? This is basically that sum rule, right? Where you say the total number of like straight flush, uh, uh, number of straights including flushes is going to be the number of straight flush and straight non-flush hands. So you add those together, which means you can do some algebra to get subtraction too. Anyway, uh, in the end, you calculate this and you get 10,200 uh, straight hands, excluding the straight flush. Okay, uh, we are almost done with this section. We've had a long discussion about counting, and I haven't really said anything about how this has to, of what this has to do with probability. Well, this entire section was devoted to the case that you may have thought was the easy case, where you have a set uh, where your sample space has finite size. Your sample space has finite size. And you decide that every element in that sample space is equally likely. And you may have thought this is the easy case. Because in that situation, it's actually rather easy to compute probabilities. You can uh, assign a very natural probability measure. The probability of any event A, which is a subset of this sample space, will be the number of elements in that set A, or in that event A, divided by the size of the sample space. Which is a very nice natural probability measure but here's the thing though you need to compute then using these counting techniques the size of the sample space and the size of your set a and that's actually tricky because now you need to use these uh counting techniques and i personally don't think the counting techniques are all that easy all right um so based off of this once we have this natural probability measure we can use counting techniques if we need to to compute probabilities so we're going to use this to compute the probability of the poker hands that we were considering above. So the size of, pos of the sample space, the sample space consists of possible poker hands. We say that each of those poker hands are equally likely. We do not care about the ordering of poker hands. So there's going to be 52 choose five such poker hands, which is going to be uh, 2,598,960 uh, possible poker hands. All right, so I want to compute the probability of each of the poker hands that we saw uh, in the previous examples. So for example 21, this was the four of a kind. So the probability of a four of a kind hand is going to be the number of four of a kind hands, which we computed to be, three, to be 624. Uh, divided by the size of the sample space, which is 2,598,960 poker hands, which is going to be approximately 0 0.0002. Uh, for example 22, the probability of getting a full house is going to be 
uh, let's see. So probability a full house is going to be 3,744 divided by 2,598,960, the number of full house hands divided by the total number of possible poker hands. This is approximately 0 0.0014. Uh, next up, so uh, for example 23. So for example 23, we're going to compute the probability of our so-called flush hand, a flush that isn't actually a, that includes straight flush, so just the suit is the same. Uh, how many, so there were 5,148 such hands possible. We're going to divide that by the size of the sample space, which is that 2 million-ish number. Um, and that's going to be approximately 0 0.002. And now for example 24, uh, the probability of a straight flush uh, that's going to be there were 40 straight flush hands divided by the size of the sample space. This is going to be approximately 0 0.00002 really 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 small and the probability of a straight so that's excluding the straight flush is going to be uh, 10,200 divided by the size of the sample space which is approximately 0 0.004 there's always kind of this question of which is more likely a flush or a straight Turns out the straight is twice as likely as the flush, which is which to me is a little surprising. It feels it feels intuitively like the straight is harder, but it's actually not. Um, and that's one that's a common trait of probability. It it defies what you feel like should be true. All right, so that's it for this section. And uh, in the next se section, we're going to talk about uh, conditional probability. So. Uh, I will see you then.